Welcome to the 2019 IDBALA Year End Seminar. On today's seminar, we have payroll and 1099 experts ready to assist you and your team to navigate the complex issues in regards to having a successful year end. Our presenters today are Kate Senzel, who's a payroll service manager, myself, Angie Ziegler, and Jillian Robinson, who is going to be covering our 1099 part of our series today. That's a new one that we did add in um, based on some feedback we've received that they wanted a little bit more information on the 1099 topic, uh, but we will be covering a lot of our W-2 and payroll parts of this also. Based on the material we have and we'll be going over today, we may not have time at the end of the sem seminar for questions. However, you have our contact information here, and I believe all of you got slides from our sent to you inside of your guys' registration. Um, so if you have any questions and we can't get to them, please reach out to us and we'll be glad to assist you with that. I will turn it over to Kate to get us started. Thanks, Angie. So like Angie said, her and I are going to be kind of covering the payroll side of it and Jillian will be doing the 1099s. So on our section for the payroll, we're going to be going over payroll 2019-2020 updates. What's um, new and up and coming for the new year, um, W-2 due dates and the penalties associated with not meeting those, and then we'll be talking more in depth about the taxable fringe benefits. So let's just jump right into this with our updates. As you can see here, our Social Security wage base is jumping, increasing again for 2020. It's going up to $137,700. The Social Security tax rate and Medicare tax rates are remaining the same at 6.2 and 1.45. Um, you do have to pay that additional 0.9% um, for the Medicare where your taxable wages go over the $200,000 limit. So that's all staying the same from 2019. On retirement plans, there are a variety of retire retirement plans that companies offer. Um, we once again see increases in all of them. Um, your 401ks, your 403, your SEP plans, 457s are all going up to $19,500 for 2020. Um, your simple plans increasing by 500 to 13,500. And for all these plans, they have what you call a catch up that if you're age 50 and older, you are able to do an additional amount into those plans. Um, the simple plans remaining the same from 2019, that's staying at $3,000. And the other plans are increasing to $6,500. And remember that for retirement plans, they do go in box 12, and they have specific codes for them. Your 401k is going to be code D, your simple plans are going to be code S, and your Roth plans are going to be code AA. Um, it's very important that you know what your retirement plan documents include. Um, so when your company set this up, they should include certain earning codes that are included and certain earnings that are not included. And it's very important that you know this from company to company uh, so that you make sure your retirement plan documents know they, what's considered compensation in your plan. So especially when you come into the year end here where you have those add-ons like your bonuses, do you include the retirement plan, your taxable fringe benefit? Because it can vary from company to company. The health savings accounts are also going up. Your HSAs, your self-only plans, they're increasing to $3,550. The family's increasing to $7,100. And then the catch-up, for the catch-up for HSAs, it's 55 and older. So don't confuse that with the retirement that's 50 and older. Um, that catch-up amount is remaining the same at $1,000 for 2020. And the W-2 reporting code is box 12, code W. And the amount that goes in that box 12 is going to be your employee pre-tax and your employer amounts. A lot of people forget about the employer amounts, but they should be included as well in that box 12. So the dependent care in your FSA, dependent care for 2020 will be remaining at $5,000. The flex spending account is increasing a little bit to $2,750. The dependent care is reported in box 10 of the W-2 is one thing to note with that additional thing. Um, there has been talk about raising the dependent care. It has remained at 5,000 for quite a few years. And they've talked about it increasing it as much as $16,000 a year, which would be nice for people that have that because uh, daycare, we all know, is, is not cheap and it's way more than $5,000 a year. But some will kind of have to keep an eye on to see if they if that anything goes through with that. But for 2020, it will remain at $5,000. So for the transportation, um, an employer may provide certain transportation fringe benefits to its employees without including the fair market value of the benef benefit to their income. They include qualified parking expenses, and the combined value of transit passes, vouchers, tokens, or fare cards. The limits for, for both in 2019 is at 265 each. 
Uh, the limits for 2020 haven't been released yet, but they're estimating them to be at 270. So we'll kind of have to keep an eye out for that. Um, an employer can offer both to their employees, the parking and transit, and each one has the limit of the 265 for 2019. So if we change gears here a little bit, and let's talk about what's new and upcoming for 2020. Um, if you recall back in December 2017, President Trump signed the Tax Cuts and Job Acts into law, which marked the most sweeping tax change in 30 years. The new W-4 form was presented previously, but was delayed until 2020. Um, we will discuss this form in great detail here and shortly. Um, for enhanced security, EFTPS is requiring password resets now. And the SSA continues to send out notices for mismatch information on W-2s compared to what they have in their system. And then finally, we'll, we'll go over um, the white collar salary threshold that they're raising this effective January 1. So this brings us to our first polling question. What form is changing significantly in 2020? Is it Form W-2, Form W-9, Form W-4, or Form W-8? The answer is Form W-4, which looks like majority of you guys got that. So here is the anticipated new 2020 W-4. So as you can see, it's different compared to the current form that employees are used to filling out. It also has a new, na new name, it's Employees Withholding Certificate. Uh, the W-4 was revised to comply with the income tax withholding requirements of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And they're, ex they're expected to release the final form uh, hopefully by the end of this month. The primary goal of this new form is to provide simplicity, accuracy, and privacy for employees while minimize the burden for employers and payroll processors. So looking at this form, you're probably wondering how will it not be a burden on employers and payroll process processors? Um, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna get a lot of questions on this because employees just aren't gonna know it's, it's such a different form that they're used to filling out. But it was, it, it's been designed to improve the accuracy of employees withholding amounts. The form no longer uses allowances and it's tied to the amount of the personal exemptions claimed on the form. The form is now divided into five steps. So of course, with any new change, there's always gonna be questions that arise and the IRS has kind of put together a guide with a Q&A section um, and these are kind of the top questions that, that seem to be asked quite frequently. And probably the number one question asked is, do all employees have to fill out this new form? And the answer is no. Employees who have submitted Form W-4 in previous years are not required to submit a new form unless they have updates. Employees that are hired after January 1st um, must use the new form. And like I said before, why was the redesign form? Um, it's to comply with the income tax withholding requirements for the Tax Cuts and Job Acts. What forms, what steps on the form are actually required? Only steps one and five are required, but the employee may fill out the additional steps if they apply to them. And so how does an employee claim exempt? So unlike, unlike on the previous form, this form does not have a line specifically for filing, for claiming exempt. So on the form under box 4C in the open section, they just write in the word exempt. And as in the past, if an employee wants to remain exempt in the new year, they need to fill out a new form requesting it this by February 15th. So does it, does it mean that my payroll software needs to operate with two W-4 forms? The answer to this would be yes, because you'll have employees that are still continuing to claim based off of the number of allowances, and then the others based off of the new form. Uh, can I ask all my employees to fill out this form? You can ask, but you should let them know that they're not required to, to do this. And if they don't submit a new Form W-4, withholding will continue based on a valid W-4 previously submitted and that you have on file. So you're probably asking yourself after seeing this form, if you haven't noticed it, how does one uh, fill this new form out? Like I said, there are step-by-step -step instructions for the five steps employees need to complete it. Um, and if that doesn't apply to them, uh, they, they can skip the step. And step one on the form is where they will enter in their personal information, such as you know their, their name, address, and social security number. And they will also check the box for their anticipated filing status. This will determine the standard deduction and tax rates used to comp compute their withholding. Steps through, two through four are optional and only need to be completed if it applies to the employee. Employees will complete this step two if they one, hold more than one job at a time, or two, are married filing jointly and their spouse also works. The employees have three different options within this step. Option one is to use the tax withholding estimator. And this estimator will compute all the relevant entries for the W-4 form for that job. The employee and or spouse will also have to complete a new W-4 for the other jobs that they hold. 
um, or two, they use the multiple jobs worksheet. They complete the multiple jobs worksheet on page three of the form to determine an amount to include in steps 4C of the W-4 form. Or finally, in the option three is if the employee and spouse together, if that's applicable, has two jobs total, they may check the box in step 2C. And this box must be checked on both forms W-4 in the household. Checking this box will result in withholding at a higher rate. However, the standard deduction and tax brackets will be divided equally between the two jobs. Steps four, three through four B should only be completed for one job in a multiple job household. The withholding will be most accurate if the steps three through four B are completed on the form W-4 for the highest paying job. Step three is where your, your employees will claim their dependents. The W-4 form provides instructions for de determining the amount of child care tax credit and the credit for other dependents that employee may claim when filing their tax return. Step, step four is optional to make adjustments for other income and itemized deductions. This would allow employees to have income tax withheld for other income that normally doesn't have withholding, such as your investment or retirement income. And this is also the section where the employee can list additional withholdings that they want withheld for each pay period. That would be entered on step 4C of the form. And then finally on step five, the employee signs and dates the form. If the form is not signed, it's considered invalid and the employer should apply the default withholding rules. So if you have an employee hired in 2020 that fails to submit a form, completed form to you, uh, they should be treated as a single filer and with no other adjustments, which means that the employer will de determine the withholding based only on a single filer standard deduction with no other entries. So after all this, I'm sure your head is spinning, um, but lucky, luckily the IRS has put together uh, lots of resources to assist with this new change. Uh, they created a publication all for itself. It's publication 15P, which is the federal income tax withholding method. And this helps employers to figure out the income tax withholding under the percentage method and the wage bracket method table using both the new 2020 W-4 form and the previous version. Uh, probably about a month ago, the IRS put on a webinar that went through the new form in step-by-step -step, uh, detail. Uh, the, web the webinar is out on the irsvideos.gov website. Uh, the IRS also wants to encourage employees to do a paycheck checkup to make sure they're having the right amount of tax withheld. And to assist with this, they created the tax withholding estimator, which can be found at the irs.gov website as well. And they strongly encourage taxpayers to use this to protect against having too little tax withheld and face a big tax bill or penalty. Uh, they're saying the estimator is new and improved from what they previously had out there, um, but we just are telling employees that just remember when using it, it's only as good as the information that, they, that gets entered. And just a reminder, as an employer, you should not advise an employee on how to fill out the form. They should always consult with their tax advisors. So to enhance security, the IRS has implemented a new policy that requires companies to update their EFTPS password every 13 months. Your password will expire 13 months from the time it was changed. If a company does not update this password with EFTPS, their payments will be rejected and will be assessed a penalty for late payments. So keep in mind if you use a software that electronically submits these payments for you, like for example, QuickBooks, we have a lot of clients that use QuickBooks that they just, you file their payments directly through there. So if you update, if your password ex would expire and you're trying to submit a payment through QuickBooks electronically and you're still using an expired password, your payment will get rejected. And if you don't notice it, you could be assessed penalties for a late filing payment. So this year, the Social Security Administration started sending out notices to employers who submit Form W-2 that contain name and Social Security number combinations that don't match with the SSA records. Uh, the penalty for doing so is $270 per mismatch error. Uh, the SSA estimates that they process as many as 250 million W-2 forms each year. And out of that, they estimate that 10% of the W-2s filed each year have names and Social Security numbers that don't match. So for example, let's say your, your company files a thousand W-2s, if 10% of them are wrong and you take that times the $270 per mismatch error, that comes up to be $27,000 in penalties that you could be charged for information that could have been corrected beforehand and to avoid that. Some of the reasons the information may be mismatched, you have typing errors, unreported name changes, 
and inaccurate or incomplete employer records. The SSA does make several attempts to try and match up the wages with the correct social security numbers before they would send out that notice. But if they are unsuccessful, the wages are moved into what they call an earning suspense file. And this suspense file contains all W-2 form information dating back to 1938. And they say that there are approximately 367 million wage records recording $1.6 trillion of uncredited wages in this earning suspense file. So make sure if you have an employee that comes to you and says that they need to update their name, that you're asking to see their new social security card with the name change on it just to verify for sure that they did change it with the SSA. You are, are also able to verify social security numbers through the social security number verification system, and this is done through the SSA's website. You are able to paper file with checking the box apply for on a paper W-2, or if you e-file, you can e-file them with all zeros for the social security number, but you can still get assessed a penalty for doing it this because you have your mismatch information on there, but you could avoid then having a late penalty. So you kind of got to weigh your risks with that. So the Department of Labor white collar salary threshold is increasing. Um, if you recall back in 2016, this salary exemption was set to increase from $455 a week to $913 a week, which was, this was a huge jump and many employers struggled to, with how they were going to handle this additional payroll tech, payroll expense. Um, but at the last minute, a judge came in and overturned it so that the the threshold remained at the 455 a week. But this was once brought up again um, this year, and on September 24th, the US Department of Labor released the final rules increasing the minimum wage, the minimum salary level for the, the white collar exemption. So this white collar exemption is uh, what provides an exemption from both minimum wage and overtime pay for employees who meet the qualifications. So like I said, the threshold um, for this will go into effect January 1st, and the new salary increase We'll put this at $684 per week or $35,568 a year, which is up from the $455 that it is currently at. Employers can use non discretionary bonuses and incentive payments, like such as commissions, paid on an annual or more frequent basis to satisfy up to 10% of the standard salary level. So let's say, for example, uh, you, an employer would pay an exempt employee. 90% of the standard salary level, which would be $615 per week, and up to the other 10%, uh, right around $68, can be paid in bonuses or commissions. But if at the end of the 52-week period, the salary paid plus the additional payments, if they do not equal the standard salary uh, level of the $35,000, the employer would have to have one pay period to make up the shortfall to get them back up to that $35,000 mark. But do remember, though, the salary test is, the, is only one of the first tests in determining if your employee is exempt. There is another part, and that is going to be, oops, we'll go over that in just a minute. But uh, So with these changes, employers will have to assess their employees that currently are making between 455 and 684 per week to determine the best way to increase the employee's income. So here's a couple options that they can do. They could, one, increase employee salary per week that they earn to the new threshold of the... All right, looks like we have lost her audio, so just give us one second. Looks like we're having trouble getting Kate in, so um, Andrew, okay. you able to... I can jump in. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, I know that she was just going over the white collar salary threshold. This is coming up in January 1, and she explained that this was attempted once before, and it failed the day before it went live. And you have to determine with salary, you have two tests that you have to pass, and it is a dollar value, and it is an exemption level, like Kate's got in here, executive, administrative, and professional. So it's not just your title or your job duties or your description of your job. It's what are you physically doing for that job? So if someone was to come in to do an audit on it and they ask, what are you actually doing? If it doesn't match the description, we may have an issue with that employee truly being an exempt employee. So you have to meet the value, which is the 684, and then you also have to meet one of these three levels of exemptions to be able to be qualified to be exempt from overtime. Um, all right, so IRS scams, and if we didn't answer anything on that DOL new salary threshold, let me know um, in our the end or on the questions, and we'll come back to that. Um, but IRS scams are 
a big talked about topic right now. So we've had situations in, in our trainings, IRS is releasing statements saying don't fall for this, report that, um, but it's still continuing to happen and it's increasing. So our W-2 scam, it targets businesses, public schools, universities, and tribes. So situations that we're seeing the most frequently is um, the classic you know, email situation where a CEO, usually an executive of a company, is sending an email to the payroll department saying, please send me a copy of the W-2 form for 2019 in a very specific format. So if you get an email like that, normally um, the best course of action is call up your CEO, your executive and say, did you just send me this email? Because I don't, I don't think um, that you would ask me for this because you've never have in the past. <laughs> the thing you don't want to do is respond to this email uh, because then they keep pushing it further uh, other thing they told us is when you're looking at the email address from who sent it to you, if you just put your mouse over top of that email address, it's going to show you that it's not exactly like our companies, um, that there's things that are just off a little bit. The other one is direct deposit emails. So I changed my bank account. I'd like my direct deposit updated. Can this be done by next payroll? Uh, we've seen this situation even talking with our direct deposit bank that we use, that they get these more than they like to say because um, anybody can, you know, hacking into an email and they can make those emails look so much like a company, even by putting the picture of the president on there or the email signature, um, the little slogan at the bottom, they can match and mirror that. So it looks very similar. The best way, you know, the best course of action on this is develop a policy and a procedure on how you get direct deposits. They have to be on the online portal themselves to do it. They have to have a signed document. Um, that they have to go through a process and not just email. And sometimes we just don't want to question like an executive being like, well, he sent me an email, I'm just going to do it. Um, be careful of that because that's how they're getting us to change those without realizing that we're sending it to a fraud. Um, but then you have to bring in a fraud investigation and we have to um, basically bring the police in and they have, to, they have to do criminal charges on this. Amy, is my, my breaking up? They're saying that my, I have a chat message saying I'm breaking up. No, you sound fine. Okay. Um, we'll keep going. We'll see if we're having some internet issues here. Okay. It looks like Katie did get back on. So Katie, can we hear you now? Oh, yeah, I'm back on. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. All right, Kate, I just covered the IRS scams. Okay. But like how this is happening, basically I'll, I'll finish the slide out for you and you can jump in. Um, okay. So you know, the last part of it is just that um, because of this, and it's been so successful, and people are continually doing this, um, there's been a 39 billion paid out in regards to fraud. So um, this, these are high dollars that we're talking about, and most likely you cannot get that money back because uh, it went to a fraud account, it closed the account, they moved on. You have no idea who targeted you. So make sure you're just being very careful, putting in those very strict policies, and follow those policies. All right, Kate. All right. Okay, so this brings us to our polling question number two. True or false, the IRS has implemented a new policy that requires companies to update their EFTPS password every 13 months. And if the company does not update this password, their payment will be rejected and will be assessed a penalty for late payments. And you can update your password on the EFTPS website. The answer to that is true. So it looks like the majority of you got that right, kind of like we just discussed a couple slides back. Um, like I said, they will be every 13 months, you are going to be required to change that password. So let's talk some forms now. Reminder that the due dates for W-2s are still on the accelerated. Um, the, due, the W-2s are due to your employees by January 31st. And they're also due to the Social Security Administration by January 31st. This is a hard deadline. There is no extensions for this. The 8922 form, which is your third-party sick pay, is due to the IRS by February 28th. And remember, if you have 250 more W-2 forms that are filed, you are required to e-file them. Also remember to look at your state due dates. Many states have adapted to this accelerated due date as well, so best practice would be to file your state the same time that you do your federal returns. So the penalties for if you miss these due dates, um, they seem to be increasing every year. They've already released the 2021 amounts and they've increased even from the, the current years. If you file them within 30 days um, of the due date, it, you can be penalized up to $15 per return. 
If you file them uh, more than 30 days, but by August 1st, it increases to $110 per return. If they're filed after August 1st, it's $270, so up to $3.3 million. But if they come in and decide that you intentionally didn't file on time, it's $550 per return with no maximum. So it can be very costly to miss these important due dates. And so that brings me to the end of my part of the presentation. So Angie's going to take over and talk about some taxable fringe benefits. Thanks, Kate. All right. So Kate went over some of the updates and the limits that we're going to be seeing in 2020. Uh, also making sure your W-2s match the 2019 limits. What we're going to talk about now is how do we get information from the paycheck to the W-2s and what goes on those final paychecks of the year and how frequently can we start taxing our employees on these taxable fringe benefits. So what we start with is payroll is simple when we think about gross income as hours times rate of pay. That's your gross income. Where it gets complicated is that not always is the income that you receive in a cash format or like a gift card or money or deposit. It is also when employees receive the benefit of having property, a, you know, apartment that's close to their um, work location, uh, services, meals, accommodation, stock. So those types of things are also included in gross income. They didn't receive cash, but they received a benefit. So we're talking about top level gross income and it's basic and it gets complicated. Part of our complication comes into is our employees see their paychecks, their final paychecks of the year. They're very excited to go get their W-2s, um, but they, don't, they haven't received it yet, so they're going to go get their tax return done based off their last paycheck of the year. Now, not all paychecks show taxable wages, so we have to educate our employees to say, hold on, you could be reporting too high of income if you do not wait for your W-2 because they will be reporting it off of gross, what they, told, what they made for the year. What we want to make sure that they understand is taxable wages is gross minus cafeteria plans, retirement plans, um, but also we could be adding things back to their gross income because we could have the last paychecks done and now we're going to put the taxable fringe benefits on. So their pay statement may not reflect that. So here's an example of what a W-2 would look like based on having uh, pre-tax health and a retirement plan. Our box one and 16, which is federal and state wages. Uh, we do not cover a lot on this presentation, barely anything with state, just because there's so many rules on that are so different to each state. So we really focus on federal rules. But on this example, box one and 16 would be, re you'd be able to reduce both the cafeteria plan and the retirement plan. So your tax wage is now our $800. So Scary Medicare only allow cafeteria to reduce it. So they have to be careful on making sure that they don't report $1,000 versus you know, eight to $900. So the taxable fringe benefits, like what are they? So we wanna go over the top ones that we see and we put on most of our W-2s here uh, with our clients that we process payroll for. But like, what is it considered? Um, a lot of people are just trying to be, I just want to give my employees something really nice and show that I appreciate them. And you're telling me I have to tax them on it, but I don't want to. So here's how we're going to explain like why it's important. And also you need to do this because if you're going to be under an IRS audit, an unemployment audit, work comp audit, that's where if, when they ask to see your general ledger, that's where they catch a lot of these taxable fringe benefits. And if you are not putting them on the W-2 as taxation, um, you're going to have some problems. So important to make sure that you are accounting for these and getting them put on your employees' paychecks. So taxable fringe benefits, how do we determine the value? How do we know when they're going to get paid and how do we do the taxes? So we have to consider the fair market value. It is not what the company purchased the item for or if the company was donated the item. It is what would it be if I was to win a TV at a Christmas party if I was to go to Best Buy and purchase that television, that's the value that has to be added back to my W-2. De minimis fringe benefit, the people will come out and say 25, 50, 75, even anything below 100. Um, the IRS will argue the point that they assign no dollar value to a de minimis fringe benefit. Instead, they look for words like occasionally, not frequent. Uh, they want to make sure that the employee is not receiving this benefit multiple times in a year. So some of them are like a sporting event. You got tickets to go. 
and you went one time. If you went for the whole season, now we have a situation that's taxable to your employee, not the one time. Employee meals, your employees are staying late, you wanna give them a meal and you provide that to them. Not taxable, because it's not, it's occasional that you do that. If you provided them lunch every single day, that becomes a taxable add-on to their W-2. Um, special accounting rule. So this is more set up for person use of auto just to make accounting for it simpler. So what they allow us to do is they let us to move the calendar year to be November 1st to October 31st. Now, if you want to do December 1st to November 30th, that's completely your call, but they allow us to move it back to November 1 to October 31st that we can, you know, 2019 end the person use of auto benefit and start doing the calculation of how many personal miles do we need to calculate to put on that W-2. Uh, makes accounting for it much easier and we're able to get it on while they still have a paycheck to withhold those taxes. Uh, depositing the taxes on the fringe benefit. Now, like we said, you, fringe benefits need to be added on at least once a year. You can do it more frequent, which more employees appreciate that because they don't like having all that done at the last check of the year or right around the holidays. But remember when you put those, you put those fringe benefits in that you're withholding taxes to make sure you still follow your um, tax filing requirements. So if you're a semi-weekly depositor, if it's December 31st, you put all of them on there, just remember you gotta look to see when that check date is as when to you need to make your tax payment. Because if we're gonna be doing your W-2s and we catch it, I can guarantee you we didn't have them done in three days. So you are going to be having a penalty on that. So make sure you're watching that you're paying your taxes. Uh, loans to your employees, when they become taxable and when they're not taxable. So you can give your employee a loan and set up a plan for them to pay it back. The moment that you tell them they, not, they don't have to pay that loan back is when it becomes taxable to the employee. So if they're paying back, pay it all back, it's not W-2 moment you forgive that loan it's taxable also if you are setting up this loan and it's less than the federal interest rate the difference between the federal interest rate and the rate you set that's taxable every year to that individual so maybe it's a five-year loan so every year you have to assess it and then put that onto the employee's w-2 be careful that you don't misunderstand what a loan is advances and a draw so a draw, not so much like a, like a shareholder of an S-Corp, but if you have um, employees who get paid once a month and they like to take a mid-month draw from their payroll, and we have an example of this happened in South Dakota where uh, this county did this and they did it for quite a few of their employees actually, and the IRS came and did an audit on them and they are paying around $87,000 in payroll tax penalties because they consider that mid-month draw a payroll run where no taxes were withheld and they were paid 15, over 15 days late. So be careful on mid-month draws. And then also an advance. An advance is somewhere, I gave them $100, $200, and they're gonna pay it back on the next paycheck or maybe in the next two or three paychecks. Um, it's not set on your salary amount. It's not set on half your salary amount. It is a flat dollar amount and it's gonna be a quicker turnaround on paying it back. Discounts, uh, we threw this one in there just because we haven't really talked about this in any of our other year-end seminars we've done. Um, just be careful when you're doing employee discounts that you're giving them a discount, but you're not going too far over it because that's when it becomes taxable to them. Uh, so this exclusion applies to a price reduction you give your employee on property or services you offer to customers in the ordinary course of the line of business in which the employee performs substantial services. So this person has to physically work for you. Uh, it can't be one day they work for you. It can't be um, very seasonal. It has to be that they substantially work for you to receive this discount. So they're saying on services, you can give them 20% off the price charged to a non-employee, so one of your customers. And then for a discount on merchandise or other property, uh, this is more of a calculation because this one is on the gross profit percentage like times the price you charge non-employees. You are allowed to have highly compensated employees to partake in a reduction or a discount like this, but it has to be offered to every single employee, not just your high comp employees. Uh, S-Corp, 2% um, shareholders, making sure that we're understanding the value and the benefit of this. 
the employer pays and can pay, not saying they have to, but they can pay 100% of health insurance or a portion of the health insurance. And we have to make sure it gets added back into the wages. Because once we come into benefits, a 2% shareholder is no longer considered an employee. This is where they are no longer allowed to partake in a cafeteria plan. So they cannot have pre-tax anything. So they can have retirement. So that's complete, completely different than a cafeteria plan. So if the company pays for their health insurance, we have to add it back into box one and 16 of the W-2 as wages. Do not withhold federal or state from this dollar amount. Because when you put it in box 14, when this individual goes and does their tax return, they're gonna have the income and then the deduction is in box 14 for them to take it back out. But you have to have it in box 14. So make sure if you have too many things in box 14 that you have them arranged so that the shareholder information is at the top because it is required. Health savings account is the same thing. They can't partake in the pre-tax. Uh, this does not go into box 12, code W. It is added into box one and 16, box 14. The employee could put it away, you know, personally too, but they can't do it pre-tax. So I'm not sure if they really, you know, if they partake or not in that, uh, but it's not a pre-tax plan. One that's not on here is uh, short or long-term disability. If the company offers that also, so remember they're not an employee. Uh, they, they come in the same rules as health and um, health savings account. Box one and 16, add it back, memo in box 14. Group term life, if you have employees, they are allowed to have a $50,000 exclusion. Now, if you are a 2% shareholder, you do not get that exclusion. You are taxed 100% on the premiums paid for that policy. So just remember, they cannot be part of the $50,000 exclusion. Reporting health on our W-2s, this has not changed in however many years we've been hearing about the Affordable Care Act that if you are still less than 250 W-2s from 2018 or 2019, you are not required to put on your W-2. You can opt in, but you are not required. Uh, and this is where you would put the employee portion, employer portion of premiums paid in box 12 with the code DD. So you are not required to put it on. Also, if you're over 250, if the employee terminates early in the year, or if the only thing this person's receiving is healthcare, um, you don't have to do a W-2 just based on filling in box 12 code DD. Third party sick pay. This is a great benefit to our employees. It is administratively burdensome to a payroll department, benefits department, but it is a great thing to have for your employees. So the, the biggest thing is know what you're setting up. So have questions, talk to people about this because how you set up that plan determines how this kind of rolls out for the year. So is it gonna be employer paid, the premiums? If it is, when the employee goes out on a leave of absence, they will be paying the taxes at that time. If the employee pays the premiums, then when they go on a leave of absence, they are not paying taxes because they already did on the premiums. Um, people will argue both directions, um, which one they like better than the other, um, but it's completely up to your company which one you pick. Poor requirements is where it gets tricky. So someone has to pay taxes, someone has to report it. And what it comes down to is, do you want the third party to pay all taxes, both employee and employer? Or are, we, are you in an agreement with them that they'll do the employees and then you'll do your own? How you do that is how the 941 is going to be reconciled. So you have to determine, did I pay our own and remember to pay the employer portion? But if they do the W-2, you, the company, has to do the 8922. If you tell them that you want to do the W-2 reporting on third party, then the third party agent will file the 8922. So one of you has to do the W-2 and one of you has to do the 8922. So just make sure that those are being filed. And the other thing with third party is that they are not required to give you that form of who had third party sick pay until the 15th of the end, the next month of ending the quarter. So if you're thinking you're gonna get your W-2 done on January 5th, you're not because you have to get the statement from your third party and they are not required to give it to you until January 15th. So just make sure you're aware if you had anybody go out on a leave of absence and take third party sick pay. All right, the awards and prizes. So this is kind of a hot topic that we get the, probably the most questions on, 
um, you know, scenarios. And, and this is where it gets a little tricky because a lot of times they're like, can you find me something that specifically states that this is not taxable or specifically states this is taxable? Now, in the very beginning, when I started with the gross income, it says everything is taxable unless it's excluded by law. So it's easy to tell you what isn't taxable, but it's very hard to prove or give you guys documentation that says, yep, this very thing is taxable because they don't list out everything else. So um, awards, prizes given from an employer to an employee are taxable. It is always taxable if it is a gift card because gift card is the equivalent of cash. So no matter what, if you give them a gift card for a safety award, length of service, which is our two items that we could have non-taxable, it is taxable. So if company picnic, Christmas party, I kind of gave the example earlier about, you know, you're at the Christmas party and you won the trip or a TV, you can identify who won and what did they win? Everybody in the room heard it. They probably drew it, said it over the loudspeaker. Um, you, it's that is easily accounted for, so you can add that back to your employees W two. And a lot of people come up with really creative ways to say, well, we didn't announce it. Nobody knows who won. Somebody knows who won. So just be careful. And also, when you, you when you talk about those audits and you talk about how they ask for the general ledger, and you label it company gift cards and it's not added back to the wages, um, it's going to be easy to identify that you gave your people W-2s and those can be, or gift cards, and those can be costly mistakes because they catch it and you have to remember that they can go back three years and assess this, that you would be filing amended returns, amended W-2s, for three years you probably can guarantee that your employee filed their tax return which now has to be amended because we are giving them more income. So just understand that this could be a costly mistake against your company. Plus, if you did it intentionally, the IRS will say you have to do the supplemental tax and you will gross this up and you, the company, are paying all portions of FICA tax, Medicare tax, and a portion of your employee's federal tax. So be careful with those gift cards. So what is not taxable? So we have two items that we can go with is a safety award and a length of service. Uh, remember, they have to be tangible property. Um, for the safety award, they got rules on, you know, less than 10% can be eligible for them. They gotta be full-time with one year of service. And there's a group of people who are not eligible for safety awards. Length of service, you have to have a tangible property, has to be presented in a meaningful ceremony, and then at least every five years of employment. So you could you could say I'm gonna start at the year six and then go five years from there, um, but it has to be every five years and if you do less, then it is taxable to the employee. Uh, just remember, don't give them gift cards unless you're just gonna tax them, which some people would rather have a gift card than a picture, but just so you know this, make sure that you are presenting it in a meaningful ceremony, tangible property, it is no longer taxable to your employee. Personal use of auto, this is business use of a personal vehicle excluded from income. Employer may elect not to withhold federal income tax. You are required to do Social Security and Medicare. The record keeping of personal use of auto is 100% the employee's responsibility. They have to be the ones who turn in the documentation that states how many miles they drive over the year, how many were for business, how many were for personal. If they were to be audited and they don't have a logbook, they become 100% taxable to that individual. So make sure you stress to them the importance of documenting this. And if they continuously see the same as last year, it's, you know, it's coincidental maybe that every year they drive exactly the same ratio of personal and business miles, but it's probably gonna be more of a red flag. So be careful of those same as last year's. So we have three methods to um, calculate personal use of auto. You're gonna see two of them are a little harder to you know, apply to your business and one is usually our standard across the board. So community value method allows an employer to value an employee's personal commute by $1.50 per one way or $3 per round trip. This is saying the fact across all of personal use of auto is that commuting from home to work, work to home is personal. So there is, so if they tell you they have 100% business, that is not true because they have to drive to work and leave work. 
So the community value, the vehicle is owned or leased by the employer. The employer requires you to commute to and from work. The employer has a written policy that prohibits the employee from using personal, any personal miles. An employee cannot be a controlled employee. So it cannot be a high comp employee, uh, board member, shareholder. Um, so this is where it kind of kicks out most of our people on this community value method. When then we come in with our most used is our annual lease valuation method. So you have to determine the fair market value of the car every fifth year. You have to remember that if you trade out cars in the middle of the year that we have to do a proration on those. The IRS has a tax table that or value table that we use and we just need personal miles driven and total miles. And if the employee has the employer pay for gas, we add on the 5.5 cents onto the value. Be careful when you do this calculation and if you need help, we have spreadsheets built for this. However, make sure that if you have someone who's going over the social security limit or the Medicare, the 200,000 that Kate mentioned earlier, that that could change your calculation. You might be paying taxes when this person's already over the limit. So be understanding of what their year-to-date wages are. The third one is a cents per mile valuation method. Um, as of this morning, I'm still not seeing anything for 2020 yet, but 2019 was 58 cents. Um, for this valuation method, the vehicle has to be driven 10,000 miles annually, and the fair market value of the vehicle when first put into use cannot exceed the luxury car value. In the previous years, we've laughed about this because the IRS put the value of a car at like 15,900 and a, a truck and an SUV at 17,000. So last year, they actually, for the first time, increased the value uh, substantially, and it was at 50,000 for both car, truck, SUV. And for 2019, the value was increased to 50,400. So now we're a little bit more aligned with what a luxury car value is. All right, so we have our next polling question is, what letter code is reported in box 12 for traditional 401k? Okay, so 70% of you got this right. The answer is D. S is for simple plan. The double A is for Roth. And the W is for health savings account. Group term life insurance, uh, another great benefit to provide to your employees. But when does it become taxable and non-taxable? It is taxable to your employees if your policy is over $50,000. Remember, they get to have the exclusion of the first $50,000. Anything over, taxable. When you do the calculation, it is as of the age as if you were 12, 31, 19. So whatever age you're turning, it's going to be that for the whole entire year. Reminder of the 2% shareholders, the 100% of the premium, and dependent group term life if the value is over $2,000. They don't get an exclusion, so it's not $2,000, anything above the $2,000. It starts at the dollar. So if it's a $3,000 policy, the full $3,000 is taxable. Um, how is it non-taxable? Is it the beneficiary of the policy is the company, a charitable organization, or if the employee termed due to a permanent disability? Also the same as the coverage less than 50,000, not taxable, independent care um, group term life, less than 2,000. Uh, group term life is subject to federal, FICA, and state, but it is exempt from FUTA. You have to look at your state unemployment to determine if it follows federal or not. The value of the calculation gets put in box 12, code C, and the calculation is on this next slide with the uniform premium table based on your age. I will say that if you're going to have dependent care, that ask your employees, I mean, this, unless you have a lot of employees, ask your employees what are their child's ages because you can calculate it off of their age versus your employee's age. Um, but if you don't want to take that on, then it's just whatever the employee's age is, we'll do it for both the employee and the dependent group term life. Supplemental tax rate, federal is at 22%. That changed last year. Um, from 20, it was 22%, but previous years it was higher. And then federal tax rate, if a million dollars of wages or, is over that, then it's 37%. Every state has their own, or they do not have um, a state policy on the supplemental tax rate. So some states are pretty aggressive. They have tiers, so it's not just one rate. It is multiple rates. So make sure you are looking to see what your state uh, supplemental tax rate is. This is important to determine because when you are doing these taxable fringe benefits, you, the employer, get to decide, do I want to do a gross up calculation for my employees 
I want to give them the benefit. I'm going to pay the taxes for them and I'm going to increase their W-2 on this. Or do I put it on their W-2? The employee is going to pay their own taxes on it and it's going to be in and out. So that is how we start our formula for gross up wages. Make sure you remember that also the same thing with personal use of auto, be careful about the social security wage limit and Medicare high earner um, over 200,000 because that will change this formula. So when you take this example here and apply it to a gift card, if the employer is going to pay the gift card and the taxes, they do a gross up. The gross up then the wages get um, input as $142 instead of $100 because remember that's what they received, a $100 gift card, that's their net. As opposed to if the employee, employer says, you know what, I gave you a gift card but you're going to pay the taxes on it, um, the employee still has a value of what they're getting, it's just they're now paying $7.65. We just put the calculation in here as the FICA, um, but generally you would add in the federal tax in there too with 22%. But just to show you that you need to have this on a live check because you need to withhold taxes from that employee's net pay. The in and out is the, the income that was put on was $100. Here's a calculation for the special situation with the social security limit. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this one too much, but this is one example how they go over the social security limit in the middle of doing the taxable fringe benefit. How would you account for that? And then the breakout of what it looks like. All right, so now we're going to move it over to 1099 reporting and move it to Jillian. Well, hello. Uh, happy Friday, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk quickly, briefly about 1099s. Here's kind of our rough agenda, just the overview. We'll do a little bit on employee versus independent contractor. Hopefully by now at this time of the year, um, you figured out which is which, but it'll at least be information for going forward. And then common types of 1099 forms filing and correcting a little bit on penalties, which are very similar to the W-2 penalties, and then we'll do a little bit on W-9 best practices. So the 1099 was um, because there was a gap between what like corporations, for example, or companies were deducting and what smaller individuals were reporting as income. So um, those people that, those that were kind of stuck in that gap is what these 1099 information returns were created for. If someone takes a deduction, on their um, books, the IRS wants someone else to pick up that as income. The main use of 1099s in that case would be 1099 contractors or independent contractors, but they're also used for interest, dividends, proceeds, and on and on. We'll talk about a bunch today. So who needs to report? Um, the payer of the funds needs to report and prepare a 1099. That entity is the one that's taking the deduction on their books. And this could be entities that don't pay tax, so nonprofits, governments, profit sharing plans, all of those are still considered payers. Even though they're not taking a deduction, an individual should be reporting that as income or um, another entity, depending on what, what box we're reporting on and such. One example that is not includable here would be personal payments. So if I hire someone to mow my lawn, for example, I'm not taking a deduction personally for that, so I don't have to prepare a 1099 for that. But if I'm a business or a building owner that has a rental activity and someone mows the lawn and I pay them for that, then I should issue them a 1099 because I'm going to deduct that lawn mowing on my tax return. Another way that we see 1099s prepared if you're not like the payer in that situation would be if you're a nominee or a middleman. And this would be when one person receives a 1099 for amounts that either go to another person completely, another entity completely, or maybe it should be shared between a few people. So the basic example on this one is four siblings own some farmland. One of the brothers, for example, receives the 1099 for the full amount. If he wants to report that out to his siblings, even though he's a personal person, not in the course of business here, he should prepare a 1099 for each of them so they pick up their own rental income. Um, another case would be successor or predecessor reporting. In this situation, most likely would be like a bank or something that acquires another bank. Those two can talk and say, hey, I'm going to just prepare all the 1099 INT forms for interest for the year. The successor could do that. If they don't agree to have just the one reporting, then they'll each prepare their own interest, for example, for the year. Um, so if you were a recipient of a 1099 INT from a bank that got merged, maybe you get two 1099s for the year as opposed to one from the bank that ended the year with your account. So who needs a form? This is the other side. Who are going to receive these forms? Um, that would be sole proprietorships, partnerships, 
would. Corporations generally do not. There are a few exceptions, which we'll address as we go, but they're generally attorney's fees and medical and healthcare payments. LLPs, which are limited liability partnerships, would. And then LLCs, that depends on what type of company it is. So they can choose to be taxed as a partnership or a corporation generally, or even as a sole proprietor. So um, that's a case where you want to make sure you get the W-9 and verify what type of entity they are. And then you do not need to issue a 1099 to a tax exempt entity because they're not going to gain tax on that income generally. So just some basics on the reporting requirements and amounts. We're going to hit this slide pretty hard or these amounts pretty hard as we get into the details. But um, royalties, interest, dividends, retirement plan distributions have a $10 limit in most cases. It's $600 or more in the case of rent, services, prizes, healthcare payments, crop insurance proceeds, and other. Other's kind of a big word, but we'll discuss that a little more as well. And then there's this $5,000 amount for direct sales. Any amounts paid if payroll taxes were withheld. So even if you paid someone, if you had an issue with a taxpayer identification number and you had interest paid to them, maybe it's yourself, I don't know, that's a weird example, but anywho, if you had interest paid that was $9, so it was below the threshold, but if you withheld $3 due to backup withholding issues, you would still have to prepare a 1099 for that. So any amount of taxes withheld trumps the um, requir reporting requirements here. This $20,000 or more and $200 or more transactions from a third party or payment card transaction, um, that relates to the 1099-K, which we'll talk about in a little bit more here, but that would be like a credit card or a PayPal type situation. This list is not all inclusive, but these are a couple of the big ones that we're seeing. I wanted to quickly talk about due dates because they're pretty important. Um, so the forms due to the recipients, those are all due to them by January 31st, 2020 for most forms, and that's so that they can file their tax return timely. 1099B, 1099S, and 1099 miscellaneous only in boxes 8 or 14 are due by February 18th. The forms due to the IRS, those are due for 1099 box 7 only by January 31st. There are no extensions for that box 7. That box 7 is the non-employee compensation box. So that's similar reporting as the W-2s. Those W-2 due dates accelerated a couple years ago. They did the 1099 miscellaneous in addition to that. Um, and those are all due to the IRS January 31st, 2020, no extensions. Most of all the other forms, 1098, 1099, the 3921 and 22, and WG can be filed by the IRS, filed to the IRS by February 28th. Um, if you're filing by paper or they give you an extra month, so by the end of March, if you're going to file electronically. And you can request an automatic 30-day extension on most of those forms by filing the 8909. As I mentioned, the box 7 is not extendable. So a quick little bit here on independent contractors. Basically, you would decide, hopefully before you start working with someone, if they're an employee or an independent contractor. And the IRS has a 20 criteria test, kind of listed them here, but it's kind of the right to control test. So for example, if you control the flexibility of someone's schedule, or you don't, or maybe you, um, that person has the ability to work for multiple companies or to, to work for the public, or be available to work for the public, um, those are some different areas of control to look at. But it's important to determine whether you're um, an employee or an independent contractor, because the IRS requires, first of all, um, withholding for W-2 employees, so the federal withholding and that, that 22 supplemental amount that Angie mentioned, some of those things are required as an employee but not as an independent contractor. Additionally, the employer would pay a portion of the Social Security and Medicare tax if you were an employee, versus a 1099 contractor, you would pay both halves on your own tax return. A lot of the employment statutes, the Fair Standard Labor Act, all of those things don't apply to a 1099 contractor. So as they talked earlier through some of those rules with respect to the overtime pay and even minimum wage and such, those don't apply to an independent contractor. Also an employer liability is different if you're an employee versus an independent contractor as far as insurance and liability reasons. And then overall, just a misclassification can be a very expensive mistake. On this next slide here, we're gonna just review so you could get penalties from the IRS for doing this incorrectly, but also you could be required to pay all the federal payroll taxes, including the employee share, all of the back state taxes, any unemployment taxes, and if you had a retirement plan or other benefits, for example, you might owe that employee 
who you thought was an independent contractor, retirement plan contributions, or other benefits that weren't included before because they were an independent contractor. And you probably have to go back and amend your tax returns, maybe some W-2s, and supply those to the employee. And so it gets really messy and really costly. So just as a word to the wise, maybe, but just make sure that you're classifying your employees and independent contractors correctly. If you want additional resources, feel free to reach out, but there's also publication 15 has some information on it. 15A and 15B all have um, information regarding this. Polling question number four. In what year did the IRS officials start conducting random audits of approximately 6,000 employers for employment tax and plans and proper worker classification? 2015, 2010, 2000, or 2001? And this is an older stat, but it just um, helps to identify or to present to you guys that the IRS is watching on this. They're doing random audits, at least they were in the year of this question, and so it's just something to be aware of. 2010, nice work. All right, we're going to jump into some common types of 1099s that, that you'll see or that possibly you'll receive as a business. Um, or individual, but 1099 miscellaneous is the one that we see mostly issued by uh, our smaller business clients, and that would report rents, royalties, other um, non-employment compensation, all, all the boxes on the form here. We'll talk a little bit more about each one, but it's important, I just want to say, to make sure you put the payment in the appropriate box. So if you're paying someone rent, don't put it in um, the non-employee comp box, for example. The non-employee comp box says to the IRS that Social Security and Medicare should be paid on that amount, and it shouldn't be on rent. Um, also, other income, if you mix that one up with non-employee comp, then maybe it should or shouldn't be self-employment tax. So just make sure you're putting your stuff in the right box. It also kind of tells the IRS where to look for that income. So if it's in the rent box, maybe they'll look on the Schedule E. Um, if it's on the non-employee comp box, they should be looking on the Schedule C. So notices that are automatic come out from the IRS sometimes just based on what the 1099 said and what's on the tax return. And if those things don't match because we put something in the wrong box, we'll generally have to amend our, our form. Other payments, or this is only for payments made in the course of a trader business, as I discussed earlier. So personal payments are not reportable. And in most cases, that box, this form is a $600 threshold, except for royalties, which is $10. So we wouldn't use this form, and this list is not all exhaustive here, but we wouldn't use it for payments to a corporation generally. Those would only be in um, the boxes mentioned. So the gross proceeds to an attorney and then the health care payments. We wouldn't do this for merchandise, telegrams, telephone, storage, that kind of stuff. So anytime you've paid someone, like a plumber, for example, to come fix something in your house or fix something at your business, I should say, since this is for businesses, but um, say they charged you for a toilet and they charged you for their labor, you really only have to 1099 them on the labor if it's easily identifiable and separate on their invoice. But if it's just one invoice, your system doesn't separate those payments out well, you can definitely 1099 them for the full amount. Um, they should be picking up the full amount of income anyway. They'll have expenses to offset the toilet expense on their return. So that should all work out. You don't have to separate it, but you definitely can. And then don't use this box or this form for employee wages, employee travel allowances. You don't have to send them to tax exempt organizations and don't use this form for scholarships. Really quick on the boxes here, you've got rent, $600 or more. Um, this would be like real estate, machine rentals, et cetera. If you did pay someone for a machine and then you also paid an operator, those should go in two separate boxes because you're renting the machine and you're um, using non-employee comp, for example, for the operator. So just make sure you keep those two amounts separate. Um, royalties, as I said, are $10 or more. If you're doing, um, Royalties maybe on surface royalties, those would be included in rents because that's a, a real estate type thing. Um, other income is kind of a catch-all box on this form. So it would be prizes, game show winnings, um, payments for deceased employees, medical research, anything that should be reported on the 1099 miscellaneous that doesn't fit one of those other boxes just goes into the other. We got the fishing boat proceeds, which is kind of specific. So if you have that situation, you might want to read the instructions related to that. The medical and healthcare payments, those are made, those are generally paid to a physician or other healthcare provider or supplier. And so if you have a health plan where you would make payments directly there in your business, you might have to follow those, but those are generally insurance companies that prepare forms with that box. 
crop insurance proceeds for $600 or more. And then the gross proceeds paid to an attorney. If you have that situation, I would also um, have you read the instructions. So feel free to reach out with questions. But those are also issued to a corporation. So even if you paid a corporation in that case, you would need to issue a form to them. The last box I wanted to talk about before we move on is box seven. It's $600 or more. It's that non employee compensation box that is due January 31st. There's fees, commissions, um, working interest anything that should be subject to self-employment tax. That's kind of how you can differentiate box three from box seven if you have an income amount that you're not sure. But some examples include professional service fees, attorneys, accountants, et cetera, payments for services, but also if you have parts and materials, as I mentioned earlier, you can just include those all in one. You don't have to separate subcontractors and independent contractors, director's fees, those types of things. Um, some things to think about would be if you had like advertising, think about what's provided, are they doing a website for you or are they paying are you paying them for pins just kind of considering things that maybe <clears throat> excuse me that don't necessarily feel like they should be on that but they should be so just keep an eye out for that I wanted to quickly talk about 1099 INT it's generally interest income received from like a bank for example but this might apply to you guys to prepare as well I just wanted to touch on it it's a common form so it'd be ten dollars or more of interest paid in the course of your, or uh, generally is the filing, unless it's interest paid in the course of your business, then it's $600 or more. Um, you generally don't need to send those to um, tax exempt IRA HSA type entities. And then um, the IRS does like you to do an account number if you have one, and if you have more than one, you definitely have to use an account number. So you might get two 1099 INTs from your bank if you have two savings accounts, for example. This 1099 dividend form, um, just wanted to show it as well. It's not super common for maybe you to prepare unless you're a corporation that would have dividends issued, but you might be receiving it. And it would be $10 or more, it would be the threshold there, $600 or more if it's part of a liquidation. Again, account numbers are not required unless you have more than one account, but they appreciate it. The IRS encourages account numbers. And the S Corp distributions out of accumulated um, earnings and profits will be reported on this form. 1099K is a newer form. It's definitely not brand new, but I just wanted to touch on it to kind of show you what you guys, some guys might be receiving it if you have a credit card processing, um, someone that processes those or your payments go through credit cards. Um, basically, though, some things I wanted to mention is that it's gross payment. So if you're a restaurant or somebody that has sales tax, say you have sales tax and tips that would be reported on your credit card payments, those will be included on this 1099K. So you'll have to just be aware of that, that that number might be higher than your total income that you report on your tax return and just take steps to verify that that's correct and that you know the differences about interest or i'm sorry about tips or sales tax also if you um, give someone a credit so someone buys 500 dollars from you and then you refund them 500 dollars, it's still going to that gross amount still going to be in there so you'll still have 500 dollars, even though you just maybe washed it out on your books instead of doing some sort of um, income and reduction of income or discount or refund type situation but again this is twenty thousand dollars or more or and 200 or more transactions. So unless you're above those levels, you won't receive a 1099K. And generally, you're not going to be preparing one unless you're a credit card processing company. This is kind of a quick list of less common 1099 forms, but I just wanted you to be aware of them. We do have a 1099 book available on our website, which I'll talk about right at the end here. But if you have questions, on these forms, that book is a good place where we have a summary of what they are, but then also the instructions are great and we're always available for questions. Just going to talk briefly about filing and correcting. Um, so the if you paper file, you can do that with less than 250 forms and each form is separate. So if you have two 1099 INT, two 1099 div, and 252 miscellaneous forms, you only have to file your miscellaneous forms electronically. Those other two are less than 250 and don't count. If you do hand, hand write, you have to make sure it's legible. These forms are machine read. And any paper filing requires a 1096, which is the transmittal that goes with the form to let the IRS know they have all the forms attached. Don't use dollar signs. Mail the originals um, with the red forms that the IRS has. Don't send in copies. And they like them flat in an envelope because they are machine read. 
this is a 1096 form. You need to file one form per type type of form. So again, if you had 1099 INT, MIS, and DIVS, then you would need to file one 1096 with each batch of those forms. Electronic filing is required for any forms over 250. It's really encouraged for all to make sure that you have the appropriate information. We're not relying on a machine to read it. You type it in, it gets uploaded, and it's actually read on those numbers. Um, they are. They also give you, you know, an extra month if you're going to electronically file, except for the January 31st due date for the 1099 miscellaneous is box seven amounts. And those are filed to the fire site, the fire system, which is fire.irs.gov. And publication 1220 provides a lot of information on um, the procedures for electronic filing if you want to spend some fun time reading that. The application to file electronically is the 4419, which is shown here on the screen. And you must file that 30 days before the due date. And you only need to file one per organization, so not per form. It's just one for your, your group to file. Um, if you want to, you, you don't have to reapply every year. So once you get it approved for electronic filing, you're approved for electronic filing. If you have over 250 and you want to request a waiver to not file electronically, you can file form 8508. This is effective for one year and it's due 45 days before the due date. So by early, late December before January, I would recommend that you file this to um, electronically file since it's due 30 days before the due date. And the first due date is January 31st. And if you want to not file electronically, that one's due 45 days. So that would, the latest of would be mid-December. Make sure you get that all approved. Some common errors on 1099s, um, kind of as we talked about earlier, making sure that it's machine readable. Make sure you include a 1096. Be sure you're including a taxpayer identification number and that it's correct. That could be a social or a federal ID number. Um, be sure you're using the correct form um, and the correct box on that form as we discussed. Don't file it late and be sure you file a form when a form is needed. If you realize that you have an error in a form, there are kind of two ways, two types for correcting those. So the first type is the most basic. Say you put a wrong amount in the box. Everything else is fine except for that amount. You need to file one 1099 with the box, the corrected box checked and just correct the amount. The type two errors require two 1099s. And that's generally if you file with the wrong name or wrong taxpayer identification number, you would need to file a zero corrected return for the originally filed form, you know, to correct that 1099 or that taxpayer identification number, for example, to zero. Then you have to file a separate original 1099 with the correct information. So that would be two 1099s required. Briefly on penalties here. Um, so therefore, not filing correctly by the due date, not filing a correct return at all, um, not including all the appropriate information, tape your filing when you're supposed to file electronically, reporting an incorrect taxpayer identification number or not one at all, or filing paper forms that weren't able to be machine read. And there's two types of penalties. There's 6721 and 6722, and really to differentiate isn't important, but Basically, the taxpayer identification number and not machine readable, those are the 6721s. And the 22s is that um, you didn't provide something to the recipient timely or all the required information isn't shown on the statement. The penalties are the same for both and they're also the same for W-2s. So as we can see here in 2011 to 15, they were pretty steady, but then if you go up the chart to the top, they've increased every year. And so these forms along the top line are the uh, sorry, these penalties across the top are the ones we're currently dealing with. And for large businesses with gross receipts of more than five million, these are the penalties. So the same as the W-2, $50, $110, 270 and 550 550 is the intentional regard. And, and in the intentional regard, disregard case, there's no limitation to the amount of penalty. Um, this next slide is small businesses. And the only difference between the small business penalties and the large is that the maximums are lower on the small business. But again, intentional disregard has no limitation. And these penalties are the same as the W-2s. So W-9 best practices and some backup withholding information. The best thing to do is probably to send a W-9 before you make your first payment to a vendor and require that you get it back. Another thing you could do is check with them annually. So maybe every January with the first payment you send them, you say, hey, can you let us know if we should update your W-9? Doesn't change very often, but sometimes it does. You can also use an IRS TIN verification program. The IRS has a way where you can log in and say, you know, is Joe Smith's social security number this? And it will just tell you if it doesn't agree. 
And so you'll know to contact him back and get a correct W-9. Another thing to do would maybe be use corporations more often because most cases corporations don't require a 1099. Or you could pay your vendors credit cards um, or PayPal or similar third party systems so that you don't have to prepare a 1099 because they will be receiving a 1099K, um, PayPal for example, and you don't have to prepare a separate 1099 because then that income will be double reported to the recipient. This is just a preview of the W-9, so they'll fill out the box here and say what type of individual corp, S-corp or partnership or whatever that they are so that you know if you need to issue them a W-9 in the cases that you're paying them income. They'll also put their social security number or their employee identification number below to make sure you have the right one. So the IRS has been getting more aggressive with respect to sending notices to people if the taxpayer identification number doesn't agree to what they have or if it's missing on your 1099s. And they'll send letters saying get a correct W-9 or start doing backup of holding. And that number is currently 24%. So this says to, to do backup of holding until you get a correct W-9. And if you are in this case where you don't start doing backup of holding and you still have an incorrect uh, federal ID number and you file the tax return in the following year, the tax return in the following year with the same wrong number, the IRS can cause you to have a penalty as well as pay that backup withholding. So the backup withholding example I referenced is just that if you pay someone $20,000, for example, you don't have a taxpayer identification number or a correct one, and the IRS has called you and said, hey, start backup withholding, and you did not, they can assess you these penalties of um, the 24%, which is 4,800, plus some penalties and interest for not depositing all of that correctly. So you could be up to $5,000 for not getting a taxpayer identification number or not getting the correct one. And this is just one example on one recipient. So you could have several incorrect W-9 uh, federal ID numbers, for example. It's just really important to make sure you get the right number. The 945 is just the form that we would use to report that backup withholding. Very similar rules to the 941. You can only pay with the form if you have $2,500 or less. If you had $50,000 in a prior year or less that you had to deposit, then you are required to deposit monthly. If you had more, it would be semi-monthly. So those are similar to the 941 rules. And it would go here in box two. And sometimes you don't figure out you need to be doing backup withholding until late. So just make sure you kind of keep that in your mind. So our last slide here is just that our we have a year-end resource on our website. So there's lots of articles and information on there. We have our 1099 books and our W-2 books, which are great little summary bits of information regarding those forms and some good examples. Um, if you are a client of ours, we also got our um, import templates and such for, for when we help you file those forms. So if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. It was a pleasure hanging out with you guys and have a super great weekend. Awesome. We do have two questions if you guys oh. want to take it one second. Sure. Let's see. Um, are there any rules from someone's W-9 to know if they should receive a box 7 1099? Kind of depends on the payments that you're making. What, what would go in box 7? Okay. That's a non-answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, you guys, there's no polling question number five, so don't worry about that. And then the last question here is, what's a TIN verification program website that you guys recommend? The IRS has a TIN verification, and I can't remember the exact website, but if you type in TIN verification IRS, it should take you there. That one is a free process or a free way to do it. Um, you can also use other programs, like I've seen tax1099.com has one, where I think it just kind of stores your data a little better and has a little bit more friendly user face, but the IRS website does the exact same thing. And I believe things like tax1099.com actually charge per verification. So you just kind of got to figure out if what you pay for is worth how it looks differently and such. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions. And we thank you to Kate and Jill and Angie for hosting this. And thank you to all the participants and everyone have a great weekend.